Good afternoon. My name is Timothy Langley, and you're plugged in to Tokyo on Fire. Today is February 20th, 2015. Two weeks ago, we talked about collective defense. Last week, we talked about the agriculture lobby and TPP. Today's burning issue on Tokyo on Fire is revision of the Japanese Constitution. Today, I'm joined with colleagues Michael Chuchek and Dr. Nancy Snow. Michael Chuchek is adjunct fellow at Temple University's Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies. He is also the very well-known author of Shisaku, the foremost blog on Japanese politics. Dr. Nancy Snow is an Abe fellow, two-time Fulbright fellow. She's currently at Keio University. She's writing a book on Japan's national branding. Today, we're going to talk about revision of the Japanese constitution. As everyone knows, the Japanese Constitution came about as a result of the end of the Pacific War. It's been in existence since 1947. So essentially, the war ended in 1945. The occupation forces came in. It took them about two years to cobble this together to get Japanese national consensus, and then it was promulgated. Changing the Constitution is a very big issue. It's very difficult. Initially, the current prime minister, Shinzo Abe, was pretty much devoted and committed to revising the Constitution. He fell back a little bit and decided that it might be easier to reinterpret or work on the interpretation of certain clauses, particularly Article 9, which is what we talked about two weeks ago, collective defense. And I think with his growing popularity and the strength of his administration, he is making moves to actually revise the Constitution. That's the topic of our conversation today. I'm joined with Michael Chuchek and Dr. Nancy Snow. Once again, let's hear what Michael Chuchek has to say about the revision of the Japanese Constitution. Michael? The problem that Mr. Abe has with the Constitution is that it really wasn't written by Japanese. And when he first came into power in 2006, 2007, his constant refrain was, we need a Constitution written by our own hands. What happened was that following the defeat of Japan, the uh, government that took over from the wartime government promulgated its own or produced its own draft of what the Constitution should be with a few what were thought cosmetic changes. And MacArthur and the occup occupation, General Douglas MacArthur, said that this was insufficient and he told his staff to write a new Constitution. And that's exactly what happened over the course of six days. Uh, they wrote a completely new Constitution and delivered the draft to the Japanese uh, representatives who were aghast at what it said, but they weren't in a position to oppose what the United States and uh, the uh, occupation was doing. That is the constitution that we have today. It was promulgated in 1947, and not a single item in it, not even a comma, has been changed since that time. Mr. Abe would like to have a constitution that's written by Japanese hands and wants one that has certain changes in the relationship between the citizen, the citizen and the country, the citizen and the emperor. And there are some responsibilities, not just rights, but responsibilities that people like Mr. Abe think that the Japanese people should have toward their country. He's been pretty much committed to this ever since he's been in a position of, of strength and power. This is actually his third um, term as prime minister. The first term, he lasted uh, one term. He gave up in between due to health reasons. He came back after a small, hi a short hiatus. Now he's in his second term. And he's always been talking about a re revision of the Constitution. He fell back a little bit thinking he might not be able to reach that with the reinterpretation. But now it seems like he has a renewed vigor. Where, do it's, where does this come from? It's a confluence of two things. One seems to be that things are not going so well on the economic front. And we certainly have seen relatively poor or not so great uh, economic figures coming out. Uh, we had a nice trade figure over the, this week, but otherwise, in terms of GDP growth and other figures, we've, we've seen only mediocre performance. So Abenomics, his signature economic program, is not something that he can really stand on. Now we've also had this, this tragedy involving Japanese civilians being killed by ISIS. Mm -hmm. And this has reinvigorated the debate over what is it that the Japanese self-defense forces can do. And that debate always comes back to Article 9 of the Constitution, the so-called Peace Clause. 
the peace clause sounds pretty clear and pretty definitive. You will not have offensive weapons. You will only have defensive. It will only be internal. It will not be to project power or especially military might outside of the bounds of the Japanese uh, archipelago. And it will not be um, directed in any way or manner towards offensive war. Absolutely. The, the, the Constitution is even stricter than that, at least on a literal level, than what you've just said. But what yes. you have said are, is the interpretation of the Constitution, and that's the tricky business. You're right. When he first came in, uh, he talked first about constitutional revision and then backtracked off of it. He tried to talk about, at one point, revising Article 96, and that's really an important article in the Constitution as it describes the mechanics of how you go about amending the Constitution. And maybe we should discuss that a little bit first. Okay. Okay, then in the first thing, Article 96 says that you have to get two-thirds majorities in both the lower house, the House of Representatives, and in the upper house, the House of Counselors, to agree to an amendment. Then that amendment is turned over to the people, and a referendum is held. And if you get more than 50% of the votes in that referendum, it doesn't have to be 50% of the total voters, it's just 50% of the votes. Mm -hmm. To agree to the amendment, the amendment now then becomes part of the Constitution. Funny thing, uh, no government has ever had two-thirds majorities in, in both houses, or at least stable ones, and so this process has never been put to the test. What do you think? Well, the first thing that, that Abe proposed was, let's change Article 96, and <laughs> which is, let's change the requirements of Article 96 to something less than two-thirds. Uh, that was floated. It lasted for about two, three weeks as an idea, and then it's been abandoned. After that, the government shifted gears entirely and went right into reinterpreting the Constitution, mm -hmm. which is something that the United States has always advocated as a fallback position in terms of getting Japan more involved in international affairs on a military level. Just reinterpret the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Abe government claims it did last year on July the 1st. Reinterpretation just gives you incremental change and it looks like people are looking for something that's broader and more expansive. When you do that though, it begins to raise shackles, hackles, whatever you want throughout the rest of Asia and that brings us to Japan's projection of its image and its its receptivity, you know, as trade partners, as consumers of Japanese products throughout this region. Nancy? How well did that go over, that July 1st decision? It didn't go over very well internally in Japan. So it's one thing, I know the Japanese government and Abe, they, they like to play to, well, China and Korea are going to be against this naturally. naturally. They're going to be rattling yeah. the cages. But... It's the Japanese people who need to be really involved in this process. And I, I thought that the ones who not only took to the streets, but just in terms of public opinion polls, they made their voices quite clear that they don't want uh, major changes to the Constitution. I think it has a lot to do with the image of the prime minister, because there's a lot going on around him and his government having to do with petitions to, uh, in response to the Asahi Shimbun articles. There are thousands of people signing petitions saying that Asahi Shimbun, a free press newspaper, made Japan look bad in the world. And, and it's sort of, you know, Abe's getting behind that, and it's, it's really making it troublesome for him to be the shepherd of this change to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. If it's a bottom-up change that, that's happening, then that's more likely to stick. But this seems to be sort of a push down, and even the verbiage that he's using about, uh, I want to have sort of a conversation or dialogue <laughs> on this, it's not very conversational. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just empty rhetoric. But I'm I'm very, I'm wondering, your first point, Michael, about how the Japanese objected to the language. I read the Japanese constitution and it, it was, of course, I thought it was quite beautiful because it reminded me of the US constitution, but I didn't view it as, oh, this is the conqueror coming in and, and telling the Japanese what to do. 
The reality was, yeah, Japan lost the war. And I think at that time, clearly people wanted Japan to be defanged militarily, mm -hmm. and it worked very well for 70 years. And it played into this image that Japan continues to project of being the peaceful nation and the caregivers of the environment, and we're the beautiful Japanese, and we are not going to promote violence or aggression in the world. That, that has worked in their favor, and, and I just worry greatly that this is going to, to kind of recalibrate the whole image and, and reputation agenda for the government and for the people, too. I, I think it worries a lot of people. In the prime minister's speech in the Diet uh, several days ago, he was very forceful. On TV, he looked very good. He was very committed. There were lots of catcalls of support from the audience. Um, but it's, it's um, remarkable that when he was talking about collective defense, he was talking about the, the Constitution, he didn't mention Abenomics, which was the propeller of change initially in his first, in his first administration. And it seems like there is a shift going on, and this shift is going, to me, it seems to, to an area that is extremely difficult. Three quarters, uh, uh, two thirds in, in the upper house, two thirds in the lower house, and then a national referendum. Uh, this, he's not just spinning his wheels, he is, he's going to move forward along those lines. He's got some challenges ahead of him. He certainly does in that he has to win in 2016. You're saying, wait a minute, didn't we just have an election? Right. Uh, yes, but in the inside the LDP, which is a party that is committed in its in all of its policy statements to constitutional revision, this is not something new. It's from the mm -hmm. very beginning, from the first from what is now it was the, called the 1955 system. So we're now on the anniversary year not only of the end of the war, but also of the establishment of the LDP. From the very beginning, mm -hmm. constitutional revision was on their agenda. They are planning and have been planning for 2016. Why? Because in 2016, the Democratic Party of Japan uh, did very well six years ago. Mm -hmm. Its senators, which are, who have six-year terms, they're up for re-election. And if the LDP and the Komeito can combine to take away a lot of those seats, they get very, very close to the two-thirds majority that no one's ever had. If that happens, it's a brand new ballgame. And this now decades-long plan of revising the Constitution becomes physically possible. But you would say, but they haven't made the sale. Mm -hmm. They haven't made the sale to the people. They're right. still going to need the 50%. Mm -hmm. Well, it's 50% of the votes. It's not 50% of the electorate. Right. If they can just get 50% of the people who show up to the polls, they've done it. Mm -hmm. This <laughs> Again, I, I, I just worry about that because we've already seen who comes out for these elections, right? Yes. It, it really is skewered to people who are backing the LDP. I mean, I'm not crazy about the electoral process here mm -hmm. to begin with. So uh, I'm just troubled by lack of democratic dialogue because again, I look at Japan and what it represents to the world, what it says it is, which is a democracy in a arena of Asia that is at times very undemocratic uh, right. countries, neighboring countries. And uh, I really value that, but I, it, you know, you can't just have democracy from an elected few, and, and there isn't really a good back and forth between those who are elected and and the the people who are coming out to vote. Young people aren't generally coming out to vote, right? I mean, or how invested are they in these in the minutia, of the details related to the changes in the constitution? Well, what's, what really happened this week that was really interesting was precisely that, that this question of democratic participation. Mm -hmm. The head of the DPJ, the new head of the DPJ, Okada, absolutely fried the prime minister mm -hmm. in, in question time over the question of the reinterpretation of last July, saying we did not have the democratic discussion. Mm -hmm. You went ahead and reversed decades of prime ministers saying, 
collective security is unconstitutional. Collective security is unconstitutional. You just flipped it over and said, oh, now it's constitutional. Mm -hmm. Where is the discussion? Mm -hmm. And the prime minister had nothing to say in response. He wouldn't have anything to say because that, I mean, any five-year-old could have seen there wasn't any democratic mm -hmm. discussion. And I think that's what brought people out to the streets. This is not a country where people regularly turn out and protest outside the prime minister's residence. Uh, but I think there is a sort of up in arms, to use maybe the wrong verbiage, about <laughs> the lack of uh, being really represented the, the way that they feel they should. And I, I talk to a lot of Japanese, granted, who can speak English with me, but they will tell me that uh, they, they're much more open in some of their dissent, just one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. than they would be in a real public venue. But they, I, I really feel that they, they sense that they just don't have uh, much involvement in all of this. And this this is a really big change that we could see in the next couple of years. That yes. We haven't even worked out, again, how that's going to change uh, Japan's image. Well, I think the democratic process was introduced and imported um, to a defeated nation. So there is there is something to the fact that, yes, we didn't write it, we didn't endorse it, we were laying on our back and asking for help, and you fellows came in and um, helped it along. And uh, of course we benefited from it, but it is not by our own hand. I think some of that is somewhat false. I think it's, um, it's trying to deal with the realities now, 70 years later, it's a completely different country, a uh, different economy. It's you know number two, number three in the world. Um, but I'd, I'd like to just shift the, the topic just a tiny bit to our earlier conversations about when it was first promulgated, and the Japan that used to be and the Japan that is today, and those that want to move forward and those that still um, admire the, the spirit of Japan and um, the history and the fact that the emperor is uh, a living god, things like that. So, And what I want to talk about is um, when you talk about these issues, whether you are a foreigner as an observer or as a Japanese who's actually... Um, someone who has the right to vote. There are things that you can talk about and things that you can't talk about. And you can get into trouble uh, at a social level, maybe at a political level, or even at a, a criminal level for being involved in saying certain things. And um, from time to time, um, I, I know you bear the brunt of it, Michael, because uh, Shisaku, your blog, uh, raises these issues up and, and they're obvious and they're, they're electric, but you get, uh, criticized from time to time, too, for going too far over, you're not Japanese, who are you to be telling or observing on us? Mm -hmm. Can you go into that just a tiny bit? Well, it's not really, but for, in my case, it's relatively simple, but certainly a lot of the critics of the Japanese government uh, from academia outside of Japan, uh, they are under constant, uh, mostly internet-based uh, attack uh, for uh, involving themselves in the process. Well, it's kind of odd that, that anyone would be upset. I mean. Americans wrote the Constitution, and the, certainly the Constitution that preceded it, the one that was promulgated in 1889. The Imperial Constitution. The Imperial Constitution. That's basically the Prussian Constitution translated. So to get on the, the cases of people who will come from outside Japan talking about the Constitution of Japan is kind of silly on a, on a basic philosophical level. In some cases, there's even uh, physical threats that are made. Uh, destruction of property. Uh, you can do things with computers uh, remotely that uh, in the past you would, would have required you going actually on an airplane and flying to these where these people are. Uh, but that process, I mean, it's understandable that there's a great deal of pride in this. You have to remember, when this constitution was foisted upon Japan, the cities of Japan were absolutely flattened rubble. Mm. Uh, charred, black, nothing. Starvation was occurring. Uh, disease, communicable diseases, hundreds of thousands of people were dying of these things. The country was literally flat on its yes. back. It, there was no capacity to stand up and, and show pride or, or to sh be able to in any way resist the process that happened. And that psychological effect of being prostrate and being forced to accept something, that is something that they've never, a lot of people have never been able to accept 
and it's understandable, and it's and it's something you cannot really condemn. Mm -hmm. Self determination. There again, it sounds like I've said before, it's a collective trauma here to the psyche of a nation, and there's no question that we should address this, but I I think it should be internationals with. Japanese nationals as well, not not just Japanese having this conversation because there are those of us here who are really invested in this country and in turn have been invested into by the Japanese government. I'm a I'm a case of that. Uh, I wouldn't have come to Japan had I not been invited to Japan over 20 years ago right. to come and see this beautiful country, and in turn. They've uh, gotten me to make a commitment over 20 years to come back and forth to to really uh, give some of my know-how. But I'm I'm certainly the first to say that it should begin first with the Japanese people. But this is a country that still wants to globalize more, and they need to have a a global conversation, including foreigners involved in this. It's not just a country that can decide this on its own and then also want to have TPP and, and go global uh, in education and these other arenas. Mm -hmm. I can think of a lot of people who would take great issue with that, though, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Snow. I know. Um, <laughs> for example, um, uh, from time to time, the airwaves are just shattered with the loudspeakers of the right-wing um, uh, political factions, the Uyoku, and they feel very strong and um, are compelled to speak out on issues that they feel very strongly about. And one of those issues is the, uh, the preeminence of the emperor as the head of state mm -hmm. and of Japan's right to um, uh, independence from the United States and leave Okinawa alone and uh, Japan has the power and the authority and the the duty to pursue its own interests. The, which is great, you know, it's it's fine to to want to stand on your own two feet. It's wonderful to want to have autonomy and self determination, but unfortunately, the reality of East Asia is the reintegration of Japan into East Asia was right. almost entirely predicated on the fact that they had this constitution, that they had Article 9. Mm -hmm. it, and you got to say, the Japanese people, the majority, must be in favor of the constitution on a fundamental level. It's lasted 70 years. Sure, the mm -hmm. barriers are high, but if they really hated it, the majority of people really hated it, there would have been someone who would have led the movement and been able to successfully adapt or, or amend the constitution. It's never happened. So too many people are invested in it. Too many people benefited from the changes. Women got the right to vote. 1946, when the first elections happened, more women, because most of the, many of the men were still out in the Pacific or in prison camps in Russia, more women than men voted. Mm -hmm. It was an election where women, for the first time, were elected to the diet. Absolutely. And these... And you, so you've got 50% of the population already there that says, hey, let's be very careful about this one. If you're going to change the Constitution, we sort of benefited from that. And then you have all kinds of other groups, labor. You have uh, the Communist Party of Japan, a major force, was banned, illegal, from its, from its outset in the 1920s. It was suddenly made, under this new Constitution, a, a functioning part of the country, and to, even today, in our last election that we had in December, elected 21 legislators to the Diet, and now it's proposing legislation and a, a very, very active part of the international and national discussion. So there are a lot of people invested in the current Constitution who don't want it touched. Mm -hmm. And it's just because, just because the LDP has a big majority in the, in the House of Representatives, does that mean that we get to go after the Constitution? A lot of people would say no. Mm. When we talk about the Constitution, I think our, our um, intuition is that it's all about collective defense, it's all about Article 9, but there's plenty more there that could benefit from altered uh, language. Are there other issues besides collective defense or, or the um, 
the ability to produce armaments for export, for example, that are hot button issues. <sighs> I I don't know about that. I just know with free speech. I mean, there's some beautiful language in the Japanese Constitution, and to your point about the loudspeakers and the right wing vans going around. Uh, you know, I'm for more free speech, not less. So if they can go around just fine, as long as they protect my right to also speak up against mm -hmm. what they're saying. So, you know, I want more voices out there, not fewer. So there are parts of the Constitution, as I read through it, that were just beautifully composed. And, I, and that's why I think that uh, I tend to agree with Michael that if there were movement against it, it would have been percolating for a long time. I, I think people should carry a copy of the Constitution around with them, have a little you mm -hmm. know, wallet or purse version, because <laughs> growing up in a country that where I'm protected by the U.S. Constitution, it's, it's really a sacred document to me. And so if you're, if you're really <laughs> starting to tinker with it, especially a political party that's so dominant here, it just, it just kind of rubs me the wrong way. But I mean, having a conversation about change, Article 9 and other parts, is great, but I just don't see that conversation taking place. Yeah. In, in, in addition, when you listen to the rhetoric of maybe not Abe himself now, but of his allies, and this talk about with our own hands, making a constitution with our own hands, you have to say, look, the U.S. Constitution, our Constitution, uh, it's got phrases in it that we are really embarrassed about, such as, African Americans are three fifths of a human being. That's right. Uh, but that doesn't mean we throw the whole Constitution out; we That's amend right. it. That's right. And so there, there's this, this disconnect, this idea that you have to throw the whole thing out, the baby with the bathwater, and start afresh with Japanese hands. And the reality that the best thing to do, if you really want to change anything, is amend it. And the government of Shinzo Abe seems to be working both angles. The, the, the rhetorical angle of, of revising the Constitution in total to please its, its uh, supporters, and then the reality of amending. And it's, it's the second one where it's trying to get its ally, the Kometo, to come along with creating the process. This thing has never been done. So let's create a process. And what do you like, Kometo? And mm -hmm. Kometo has this idea of a, an amendment about the right to protect the environment, which is, a, I'd like to see what the language is for this thing, uh, what, what, how, what's being given to the people. But there's something having to do with the environment. And the LDP and Mr. Abe have been very open to the idea, okay, well, let's do that first. Mm -hmm. And then that establishes the process, and then we can move on to things that interest us. And that's what probably we're going to be looking at. Well, I thought the Komeito had some real issues, though, with making changes to the Constitution, right? I mean, they're not necessarily in agreement with the LDP's changes proposed, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. They're absolutely not in, in agreement with them at all, uh, which is why they have to figure out some kind of sweetener, mm -hmm. some way of right. making <laughs> this process. And, and the, the, the Komeito's particular history well, it's not of the Komeito, but of its mother organization, the Soka Gakkai. Its first two leaders were both imprisoned under mm. security laws mm. of the pre under the previous constitution, and they definitely don't want to go down that road again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they're very sensitive to too many changes, I would, I would imagine. Well, I think it's, I don't know, I think it's a foregone conclusion that the Constitution will be revised. There's just too much history. There's too much, much uh, planning, and it's just it continues. I mean, this is this discussion has been going on in closed doors and open doors for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And yes, right now they must contend with Komeito and Komeito's wishes. And Komeito might like to change the Constitution if it dealt with this issue, but not this issue. Let's just establish a precedent. There has been no precedent. So that's why it's it's so difficult now. Mm -hmm. But I think with the the new election system, the way the uh, the last election was run, the kind of um, the historical 
power of the LDP has been, in my mind, reestablished. And bringing it back towards the center, I think, is going to be very difficult. So I think probably it's, uh, it's at some point in time, there will be a revision of the Constitution, which will allow collective defense initially, but also open up uh, trade issues for export of military armaments and that sort of thing. The Japanese are very good at, at the manufacturing part of it. And in fact, the United States relies on the Japanese to provide lots of high-tech components, but they're restricted from providing other kinds of things that could be considered as offensive weaponry. There's a slight difference there. That, that problem is, is really, it's, it's, an, it's derived from the Constitution, but it's not pr forbidden by the Constitution. The three principles of arms exports were uh, thought up during the 1960s as a way of embodying and in, 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 in making concrete Japan's commitment to peace. So these principles were drawn up about not exporting war making capacity to areas that were uh, engaged in warfare. And the, the barriers and the boundaries on that have been moved. And we saw that most dramatically this week in the story of the unraveling, seemingly, of the Australian-Japan submarine deal, which is intimately tied to the survival of the Abbott government mm -hmm. in Canberra. If Abbott does not survive and is in re replaced, doesn't that throw the entire deal off? And this would have been the first weapon systems, well, a, an actual submarine, a whole th a military delivery system, a deal that Japan has ever struck with a, a country of any, not even the United States has ever bought anything from Japan that was a, a war-making device. That seems to be off the table, but for not for the constitutional reasons, but simply because it was a, a private deal. But we're probably going to be seeing, you're right, in the future, constitutional fights within the diet claiming that these changes to the export rules are indeed violating uh, Japan, the spirit of, of Article 9, if not actual, the, the actual words. If, if Japan could um, only promote and protect and uh, project and uh, polish defensive capabilities, why is offensive that much more important? So for example, it, it is an, an island archipelago. It has the Koreas to the west, it's got China that is growing. Um, it has some certain threats, but couldn't it just be a, a gem in, in world geopolitics by having defensive capabilities that are so superior that nobody would try to come in and invade them or take over their islands or pull coral from their seas? Well, that's, that's the Swiss option, you know. But at that point, you have to look at how Switzerland has worked within Europe. Well, for the longest time, it had universal ma male conscription, right. so everybody had to serve. Everyone was, was taught to fight to the end, in armed, a gorilla, to the teeth. armed to the teeth, in a guerrilla warfare, hidden weapons, armaments everywhere, so that anyone who ever tried to attack the country would face a highly, uh, a, a real war fighting capability that had many, many deep layers. Mm -hmm. Japan has not had conscription since 1945. It's an entirely a volunteer force. To start conscription now would be an even worse and more difficult thing to attempt to do than amending the Constitution. So you just don't have the people, you don't have the training, you don't have the arms to be the Switzerland of East Asia, I don't think. Mm. Okay, I agree with that. But does it have to be either or, because as you talk about going from this defensive posture to an offensive posture, in my mind, I'm predicting a, a great deal of backlash against Japan. External to Japan or Yes, internal? external, and not just the predictable also-rans who are always there that, that the Japanese officials will bring up and say, yes, well, they are always bashing us. I'm talking about people who might be considering coming here or investing here and then see a, an aggressive Japan. And all they have to do is watch a few movies, as yes. I watched this week, Bridge to the Sun and Three Came Home with Claudette Colbert, these wonderful uh, war movies um, that uh, show a different Japan. 
uh, and and yet they they're very close to what was the reality then mm -hmm. of a very much a an aggressive occupying uh, Japan. And I I again I maybe I'm in the lofty idealism uh, clouds here, but I just uh, I don't think they have to go Switzerland option, but. The, the safety and the security that we feel living here and with the um, knowing that people are not armed it, and, and also the level of trust. I mean, Tokyo, it was just announced by the Tokyo police how much money was given back. People found that they turned into the police. It's an incredible mentality that I could see very much changing because this is going to be really Well, even if it really doesn't really change, you, yeah. you can't sell it as well. No, yeah. you certainly can't. Can. <laughs> really, I mean, that's the appeal that I had coming to Japan when I was invited. I had been a Fulbright student in Germany, so <laughs> I, I have uh, more of the ancestral tie to Germany, but I must have been intrigued with how these two countries were able to Redevelop, of course, with with a lot of U.S. help after uh, they were mm -hmm. defeated. But it it's an incredible story that, yes, it that is. is not it has never happened anywhere else. So why not preserve that? Yes, there's the question also, and that's bringing up the German example is perfect because <laughs> with the German example, whatever Germany wanted to do in terms of transformation, it could be okayed by the other members of of the European Community yeah. or or bodies that existed before the EU mm -hmm. or the EC. Mm -hmm. Japan has nobody no, to, 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 say, to speak for it. Mm -hmm. It's got the United States, its main military ally, but the United States is outside the region. Right. Mm -hmm. It's invested in the region. It is the police officer of sorts of the region, but it's not in the region. And the, the, the countries that are in the region are all opposed to any kind of changes that brings Japan into a different uh, security relationship. And it's basically Article 9 is what we're talking about. Okay. Constitutional revision, I mean the Constitution is 103 articles and some of them are silly because they apply only to a specific instance. There's one having to do with with taxation that's, that has to do with lo the way taxes, local taxes are distributed. It's never been enforced. Okay. It's just there that they would rather throw out. But it's really Article 9. Mm. That's, that's yes. the crux of the issue. And that's the crux of the issue for military planners in, the, in Washington. They, they would love to have a, a yet another military ally in East Asia. Uh, but you lose something as well. There's a real loss in terms of having Japan as in, the innocuous power, if you want to call it that, in the region. And it's the reason why Mr. Abe and his family could be even dream of coming back to power. I mean, his, his grandfather was imprisoned as a war criminal and was going to be put on trial for having led the country into World War II. Uh, the only way they could be brought in was through this constitution, mm -hmm. because the constitution was going to keep a lid on whatever they were going to do. Mm -hmm. And it has kept a lid. It was able to it's been able to take on and, and hold down an extremely conservative party. And what we have is an extremely liberal society with an extremely conservative majority party. And that's the Constitution. That's the rub right there. Mm -hmm. And you know the original womenomics, by the way, is in the Japanese Constitution. It is incredible how it empowers Japanese women for the first time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I, that's why I say people really ought to study this document and, and see the incredible progressive change that has taken place here. But without that document, you, you wouldn't have it. So th this is, uh, it's an extraordinarily powerful document. And in the name of security, I'd rather have that document than rearming this region. Mm -hmm. That's a different way of looking at security. I feel less secure to have Japan go on the offensive. If they get attacked, yes, they can defend themselves. But this sort of getting into military sales, and I, I, I've studied the U.S. brand in the world for a long time, <laughs> and I've seen that go up and down because of our being the world's uh, superpower yes. militarily, economically, culturally. 
And it, there's a lot of pushback to that. Nobody's neutral. And people have been, if, if nothing else, I mean, very pro-Japan or neutral about Japan because of this sort of flavor of being the, the peacemaking, peace-loving nation. Well, I don't know if it's a peacemaking. It, it does get involved in, in peacekeeping operations very, very reluctantly. But I think at the end of the war, you know, obviously Japan had a very serious brand issue um, throughout uh, the rest of Asia and probably throughout the, the rest of the world. And I think even now they have a bit of a brand issue. And um, if what I predict is accurate, that indeed they will change the constitution to accommodate collective defense at, at a minimum level, if not actually be able to do uh, defensive capabilities, I think the greatest resistance will not be internal, it will be external, mm -hmm. as you said. Mm -hmm. And Japan needs to go quite on the offensive to change that image and to change that, that brand that they have because uh, the, the region really suffered a lot uh, in World War II at the hands of Japan. And so far with this going on the offensive, what we've seen over the last year or so has been met with a lot of negative global news media coverage. I'm not talking about cool Japan, but rather whenever this issue of these changes to security and the constitution, state secrecy, all of these uh, textbook revisions, um, the, the press is just having a feeding frenzy on it. And it's then, it's putting more pressure on the Japanese free press internally to self-censor. I mean, it's been very noticeable as somebody who studied the media for a long time to see, uh, again, a troublesome direction. People ought to be speaking up more, but I think they feel like they can't say as much because of what we were talking about earlier with the pushback and with feeling like, hey, it's not worth it. If mm -hmm. it's going to be this chilling effect on my ability to speak up, yeah. <laughs> I'll bow out. Can, can we talk just a little bit about what you've said, the Japan free, free press? Um, this week, there's been a lot of movement with NHK and uh, the little bit of a brouhaha that's going on uh, inside the parliament and also outside. Michael, do you have any views on that? Because it's been very active, hasn't it? Well, Abe came into power with this idea that what's wrong with Japan is its messaging. First of all, it's messaging to its own people. Mm -hmm. And what we need is a change of direction at the nation's broadcaster, NHK. It's not a division of the government, but its, it's budget is okayed by the, the diet. And it basically keeps a good eye on what the power structure wants it to report. Doesn't the prime minister appoint the head of NHK? He, he appoints the, the, gut board, the, uh, the governors and the governors they, are, are approved by the diet. Um, and in the case, in this case, he appointed a man named Momoi to be his, well, a, per, a, a rather malleable figure. Uh, he was indeed also a long time uh, financial and political supporter of the prime ministers. And he's been an embarrassment. Mm -hmm. He's saying things that one should not say if you are the head of what is supposed to be an independent news organization. In his case, well, it's an entire network. It's entertainment. It's dramas. It's, it's uh, comedy shows, all kinds of things. But the face is the news. And he has made statements about what they can program and what they cannot that would seem to contradict his mandate of maintaining the independence. Mm -hmm. And the opposition parties have had a field day and he's required to come to the diet and answer questions. And when he does, it's a fiasco. And it was a fiasco this week. Uh, now, there may be changes in the wind. Uh, the prime minister appointed one of the governors, a very famous author, Hyakuta Naoki, uh, extremely controversial, uh, author of the Ean no Zero, uh, the Zero Forever. I don't know what the translation would be in English in this case, what, what they've chosen. But it's the story of kamikaze pilots, uh, and it was made into a major motion picture. It's been made into now into a TV uh, series. Uh, extremely nationalistic, uh, extremely fatalistic, uh, not showing people as being part of the modern world. 
And this guy is really, really right wing in his private life. His writing is one thing, but his private life is just completely overboard. He campaigned for the right wing general, uh, Tamogami Toshio, and called the left wing members of Japan trash. Um, he, 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 when the great uh, Takako Doi, Doi Takako, recently passed away, everyone you know, said, how, you know, how sad. She was the head of the Socialist Party. Mm. Uh, she was a great woman. He was the only person to say, thank God she's dead. <laughs> that traitor. And on Twitter, and that is just a disaster. He's going to be leaving. He's, he, well before his term is up, he said, I'm going. I'm gone. Maybe Momoi's going to go too. And then there'll be less of this really, really traumatic experience at, at NHK. But I do want to say one thing. Even though right-wing members of Mr. Abe's uh, circle have been appointed to NHK, uh, its most important product, aside from the news, is this: what are the morning NHK dramas. Oshin, the very famous oh. uh, show, started out as one of these morning dramas. And the last two, under the Momoi administration, have been hysterically and angrily against war and against the pre-war mm. organization. Mm. Um, it's a depiction of two women's lives. Um, currently, there's one about uh, the family or the, the, the husband and wife who brought whiskey making to Japan, and she was a Scottish woman. And her experience trying to live through the 30s and 40s, and now in the war, she's now, in today's episode, she's taken away by the, the secret police, uh -huh. uh, even though she's a Japanese citizen. It's, it's, these things are extremely popular, and they really reflect both a sense among women, because this is basically geared for women, uh, that the pre-war era really was bad. Mm -hmm. It was just... Really, really. Pre-1945 was a nightmare. And it contradicts this idea that NHK can be completely controlled mm. politically. Maybe you could affect the news, but there are people who are going to make these, these Winnie series that are going to be fighting back. And it's a really interesting, much more complex story than perhaps you're seeing in the international news. You're right, and that is a fascinating point, and I celebrate that program. <laughs> I wish I'd been tuning into it. Um, NHK is such a powerful nation brand for Japan. When you travel internationally, it is the BBC of Japan, is what people tell me. And, and maybe that was originally what they had in mind with the organization, uh, the potential there for it to reach much greater levels is, is very high. And there are very talented people. I've talked to a lot of people at NHK and some who were on the way out, who were the internationally minded, who were close to retirement. They're very progressive. They're very worried about this brand that they've helped to shepherd along. And, and I, I would really like to see them do more programming, news programming, this type of drama and also do more English language programming because that would bring in more global viewers. I watch Newsline when I'm in the United States and that's been around not too terribly long, but they now, I think they will um, have it online too mm -hmm. as well. So it, it's again, it's showing a more modern Japan. But to your point about women <laughs> really having a rough life, again, I've been reading a lot about that and I think without a woman's movement here, which hasn't happened, uh, then this will be really less will be accomplished here. It's just remarkable. There has not been anything comparable to what we saw in the United States in the 70s. A women's movement and I think a much more inclusive human rights movement, uh, recognizing minorities of all stripes. And uh, I, I would love to see that. I would celebrate what's happening in Shibuya and Yokohama lately with this acknowledgement of even same-sex couples. This is really eye-popping for Japan mm -hmm. well, to it's see this. Well, so, but same-sex I mean, same marriage is unconstitutional. <laughs> yes. and, that's one, and that's one that Mr. Abe can sell. The, 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 con true. the Constitution true. of Japan <laughs> defines uh, marriage as being between a man and a woman, saying that men and women both have equal rights to pick the, the partner of the opposite sex. Yeah. Uh, that's not the exact wording, but it, that's what it means. And so it's constitutionally mandated. And if you wanted to, to play with that, Mr. Mr. Abe could. He said, look, look, this part of the Constitution, 
which was designed to empower women, has disempowered homosexuals. We need to change that. Maybe his wife will get into his ear. Ah, uh, yes, that. that's I'm right. Sure, I'm sure she will. <laughs> no, but she, you know, she well, she was at in the at gay pride gay, last gay, year. That's yes. right. And, uh, <laughs> I'm sure she'll be there again this year. Mm-hmm. Again, that's had a softening. Sure. Uh, touch to mm-hmm. added to Prime Minister Abe. Yeah, well. and, the, and the family law issue is really interesting. This week, in the last few days, the Supreme Court, for the first time, has taken on cases involving uh, the separation of names, which is uh, the current law, family law, requires that you the a couple either take the husband's name or the wife's name, but there is no ability to, t- to keep your maiden name if you're a woman, right? Mm-hmm. And there's also a requirement that a woman, once she gets a divorce, has to wait six months before she can marry again. Uh, this is, and it doesn't matter how old she is. This is supposed to be to prevent uh, children fathered by the previous father to be registered as the child of the other. Mm. It, these are really, really ancient concepts, but which the diet has not been able to handle. Mm-hmm. And the Supreme Court, which normally stays away from everything, has convened a special bench for both these issues mm. to, and it's, re- it's really unusual because under the Japanese constitution, it has the right to do this, but it's never exercised this right ever. And in this week, just in the last few days, it has said, these are issues that are about life that are important that we must talk about and must, we must make it come to a decision about. And Well, they've got that right because that's, there are a lot of missing pieces to this womenomics this phrase that gets bad, bandered about, and it, it, it would include reproductive rights and family, how we define family. There are a lot of things that I hope that they will consider, rather than just getting 30% women executives by 2020. That's <laughs> And you also want to increase the birth rate, whatever happened <laughs> to that as part of this. I mean, all of these issues play into that because people have children when they believe in the future. Mm-hmm. That's right. Uh, no, I, okay. I mean, it's just a simple formula. You don't bring children into the world if you've stopped believing that your country is making progress. If you have hope, if you, yeah. you lack hope, you're not gonna, you're not gonna procreate. It's not just a money issue. I mean, mm-hmm. it's often painted as that, but. You rub shoulders a lot with journalists here in Tokyo. There's a lot going on at the Foreign Correspondents Club in Tokyo. And frequently I hear, that um, people regard the uh, the general press here in Japan uh, relatively highly. They think it's um, it's uh, balanced in terms of the broadness and the readership and uh, readability of Japanese newspapers. Once again, getting back into the branding. I mean, if if a constitutional revision is going to be successful, there needs to be a lot of messaging pumped out either through NHK or or through stories or through reporting. And the question becomes, you know, is the Japanese government able to mold that that story, or is it actually a free press and people have uh, the full right? to evaluate information that's presented to them. The, the information is relatively free in an internet age. Um, is the press going to be able to provide that kind of uh, background? <laughs> I'm just thinking along a continuum because you, what you're presenting is public information and then along the continuum to propaganda <laughs> right. or advocacy. And the government certainly has its case to make and it can frame the narrative as it wishes, uh, the government, uh, the parties in control. But th- at the same time, there has to be a framing of the debate within both news, facts, and opinion. And uh, the more that we have uh, people uh, consuming the facts and then sort of making their own judgment and opinion, the better. And uh, as far as the Japanese press system, I think there are some ongoing problems having to do with the press clubs and sort of a closed nature of it. There are a lot of press who just follow Abe around everywhere, and they become stenographers to power. They're just Mm -hmm. sort of reporting everything that he says. Okay, they have a role to play, Um, but they're there is that additional role, uh, the leading liberal newspaper really getting beaten up on uh, of late over and over again to the point where they're now being dragged into court possibly with this petition going around mm-hmm. saying, Asahi Shimbun, you have tarnished Japan's 
image in the world. And I am thinking, no, actually, they're enhancing Japan's image in the world. I just don't get mm -hmm. it because they made a correction, which newspapers are supposed to do. They're part of the first draft of history. So I'm, I'm confused by this why beat up on this paper. Oh, it's liberal. You're talking about the comfort issue. Yes, comfort women mm -hmm. issue, which, again, sexual slavery <laughs> is, is not going to go away. And you, uh, this is, again, an issue that plays widely outside the United States. I'm, I'm working on a paper right now with a couple of scholars from the U.S. looking at the indexing, how this uh, issue has been presented in the press in various newspapers, including coming out of Korea. And so, of course, I know I'm opening myself up to more scrutiny, but I believe so strongly in telling that story and how the press has presented mm -hmm. it and getting the facts on the table, because there's so much rumor mongering that goes on. And even with this textbook, this McGraw-Hill textbook, uh, it's very hard to figure out why the Japanese government did this reach into New York and go to meet with uh, the publisher and their reps. And um, the, there, it was not a good meeting, at least the way it was reported. And so I want to know what was, what was the driver there? Was it just mm -hmm. to get it completely excised from that book? Because you can't uh, just sweep away history. You just can't do it. But you can certainly... Uh, and, of course, a lot of the history was lost as well, as mm -hmm. we know, destroyed. Right. So. Well, in terms of the, of the press reporting, uh, it's, it's, you're right. It, it may not actually, at the FCCJ, FCCJ uh, there are going to be some reporters who don't like the way the Japanese press is and, and can find easy things to criticize. There's a certain personal pride in, in their own organizations that comes into that. Sure. But... The problem is actually not with their, with them, it's, it's with the Abe administration. In issue after issue, the nuclear reactor restarts, the Secrecy Act, the revision of the Constitution, every time the government sets up, we're going to do this, support for that idea declines. And the more they talk about it, mm. the faster it declines. Mm. It de and this is a complete reversal of the Koizumi effect, which was when Koizumi would say, this is what I'm going to do, the people would rally to him. <laughs> and the, the support for that idea would increase over time. The Abe effect is the exact opposite. And at that point, if you're going to talk constitutional revision, you're going to talk really something dramatic to start off with because that's the best you're going to do because you're going to see declines as it goes, the process comes along. Hmm. And that's, that's what Mr. Abe is running up against. Well, revising the constitution, any constitution is a long-term prospect. And I perceive that the uh, coming 2020 Olympics in uh, Tokyo is going to be a showcase for Japan and probably uh, an event worthy of Japan taking this to the next level. And I think that uh, as in the 64 Olympics where Japan kind of crawled out of its shell, built the Shinkansen, a television in every house, refrigerators, people were beginning to actually aspire to car ownership and that sort of thing. I think, I mean, that just completely changed Japan and the economic boom started as a result of that. I think the uh, Tokyo Olympics in five years uh, is a, uh, is a fulcrum point for Japan. And I think that, I mean, the Japanese will do a magnificent job, far better than any of us can think of now. And when they do that, then the hearts will open, the world will open, they, everybody will recommit themselves to, wow, Japan is really cool, and look what they've done over 70, 80 years. How were they able to do that in human history? It's never been done. And I think that probably that will be the time places, uh, pieces will be in place, and uh, I think it's a, you know, like they said, let you be born and live in interesting times. Mm -hmm. uh, these are very interesting times. Um, there is plenty of change underfoot. And even as, as residents of Tokyo, we see this every day. You don't need to be a, um, a, a deep consumer of, of daily news to see things changing on a daily basis. Truly, and I, I mean, that's why I'm here <laughs> more than anything is to be involved in that process because I would love to be part of the Olympic spirit where there's a sense of shared pride. So it's, 
it's the Japanese people putting on a great show, but it's also international athletes and the whole, the international news media really sharing in that. We've seen a lot of Olympics that have not turned out as well uh, recently in, in Sochi, where there was a lot of dissension and protest. And I, I don't anticipate that here. Uh, I'd certainly hope that that won't be the case. And But I, I do think that this is going to be a very short five years. I've, I've written lately that you can't think uh, about the Olympics in 2018. You have to think about it right now, today, and what that's going to mean to this country. Yeah, and but, but the, 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 the point that you made, that in 64, there was a transformation, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. absolutely correct. And people like Mr. Abba would say, yes, that was the material transformation but I'm going to lead the spiritual yes. transformation. Mm. And that's where the constitutional revision, the relationship of the people to the emperor, all these things come into play because we have achieved the material revolution. Now comes the spiritual, almost certainly. With that, I'd like to draw today's discussion to a close. You've been listening to Tokyo on Fire. I'm Timothy Langley. I'm with Michael Chuchek and Dr. Nancy Snow. For a podcast download of this transmission, please go to iTunes. For video transmission, go to YouTube. You can send your comments and recommendations and your observations to us via Twitter at hashtag TokyoOnFire. Thank you for joining us. Come back and visit us next week.